Hey everybody, Jay Young here from King Operating. If you will, go to kingoperating.com, our website, and learn more about the oil and gas business. Every Friday I do a newsletter and I do a video that will teach you something about the oil business. And if you want to know something about the oil business, send me a question and I'll go over those on our Friday newsletter. So kingoperating.com, learn more about our business and get involved. The Jay Young Show is a weekly podcast featuring insightful discussions with anyone from big business CEOs, celebrities, to military heroes. Each interview is a personal conversation about business, life, and anything in between. And now, your host, Jay Young. Hey, thank you, Jay, today for showing up. Here we are with Dory Wiley, and obviously we're going to talk about what's going to help kids, what's going to help high school students, what's going to help college students. You know, the college you choose, you know, they say that it's a 40-year decision in some cases because what you do in college, who you know, what you know, which we're going to talk about. We're going to ask Dory, hey, is it who you know, what you know is the most important? But also, too, you know, what happened? What did you do in your 20s that you regret, maybe? Probably not with Dory. But what is it that you'd have done differently? Where's that path that you can go on for success? So let's talk to Dory Wiley with Commerce Street and uh, been on CNBC several times. You're you're all over the place. Why why, why does CNBC? Well, I'm a, I'm a grade D celebrity. When they get down to the bottom list, you know, and they, everybody's turned them down, they call me and they get comments. You get a twenty five dollar gift certificate yeah, out back, exactly, you know? or, or a cup with CNBC on it, <laughs> or Fox or whatever. Oh, but they do. They do. We've got some great it. PR people in New York, and yeah. and I go up to New York once a month, and. Um, uh, they'll book book four or five of those, you know, while I'm there uh, doing business, and then we have a team of six people that prepare different things depending on what's going on in the marketplace. So I'm always kind of teed up for it. Okay, so they ask you about the economy, the stock market, exactly. It could be anything. Yes, yeah, so, uh, just what's going on in the trade war. Sometimes it gets political, but more, more often than not, it, you know, banking is a specialty of our firm. The economy, the market, trade wars, you know. Uh, how, how it's affecting interest rates, um, you know, debt, uh, specific companies, corporate finance. Wow, that's good. Yeah, really. So good. it's a lot of coverage, but we have a whole team that, that takes care of it. Okay, so, so tell me more about Commerce Street and what what they do. Sure, Commerce Street. Uh, we have a holding company, Commerce Street Holdings. We have a broker dealer, and we have uh, an investment management side. So the broker dealer is think deal business, buy and sell companies, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we raise capital through private capital and private placements. It may be for direct deals. It may be for funds that invest in deals. Uh, we're very heavy in the banking industry. We've been number one in Texas and the Southwest for 23 years, top five in the country. But we're also uh, deal in oil and gas, real estate, healthcare, manufacturing, anything that we can sort of figure out. It's not too complicated. Mm. And then on the investing side, we have private equity, hedge funds, structured finance. Uh, we're in the 401k retirement business. We literally have the best 401k plan in the country, uh, which is a fun, passionate topic for us. What, what, what's different about that? What, what's what different you, about it? You said you're number one. What, what's the difference? What somebody, If somebody listening, they're going to go, man, I want to call Dory Wiley at Commerce Street. Well, you I know, want to know the, more about it. What? A lot of people don't realize there's a lot of problems in 401ks. Uh, there's been 81,000 lawsuits, fiduciary lawsuits, in the last 10 years. Wow. 81,000. Think wow. about that. And it's rarely even covered by the news. There's currently 64 pages of lawsuits on the 401k docket. Mm. And you know, well, what's the problem in 401ks? 90 plus percent of the plans we look at are in violation of current Supreme Court uh, law from 2000, May of 2015. Mm. 90% of the plans we find problem, legal problems with, the fees are, they're, and they're, it's under fees, it's under cost, it's under performance. Fiduciary issues, uh, performance issues. Uh, you know, the industry started with mutual funds and insurance companies selling you a product. Okay, so think some Wall Street firm, pick one, Morgan Stanley, John Hancock, Fidelity. They come in and sell you a product. When actually, the way the 401k ought to be run is as a fiduciary, where a Wall Street firm comes in and says, you know what, we'll be a fiduciary. And we're going to get you the best product in the marketplace. Mm. It's a totally different approach, but when you do that, it aligns your interest with the trustees of the 401k from the plan sponsor and the plan participants. So it's really not that difficult once you 
set it up from that standard. Okay. So okay. Our, our plan really is the lowest fees, lowest costs, lowest expenses, uh, no conflicts of interest, and our models outperform every target date fund in the marketplace. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Good yeah. for you. That's more than you wanted to know. No, it's, it. it's not. You can tell we're passionate about it. Yeah, I know you're very passionate <laughs> about yes. it, obviously. If you can be yeah, all over the and place. then we also uh, manage portfolios for high net worth individuals, small foundations, endowments, uh, very low cost, high performance uh, top portfolios. So do you all invest in um, the stock market? Both stock, stock market and private and private real estate, oil and gas, all Ex the different exactly. alternatives there are. Exactly. Banks. I know you. Yeah. So uh, you know, real simple. The the mentality uh, for that business is have really really low fees and low turnovers and low cost and stocks and bonds, and get your exposure. You know what we call beta or market exposure. And then when there's alpha to be made, let's say emerging market debt, high yield, private equity, you know, real estate, private real estate, then you really focus on net returns and who the managers are and make sure you get your diversification set so that you're at least doing above average because you don't, you don't, you don't want to lose money. Mm -hmm. Our whole strategy is to lose less when the markets get hit or are volatile. Right. And when we do that, it makes it a whole lot easier. So, for example, if the market loses 50%, I got to make a hundred percent to make it up, mm. you know. So if I lose less, then I'm way ahead. Right, right. So that's a that's a core element of our strategy. That where you got, and, and that's where I guess you're into alternatives and and spreading out the risk for your investors. That's correct. Okay. When did you start that business? Um, the four hundred one k or the the, the commerce portfolio. Street. Or well, commerce just... Street. We started in. It was a friendly lift out. You know, my partner started the core company back in nineteen eighty eight. Okay. I joined him in 96. Okay. Uh, and then we did a lift out for Commerce Street Capital in 2007, October 2007. Not a great time to start a financial services <laughs> firm focused on banks, by mm. the way, during the downturn. Uh, but, you know, hey, we're still here. And, you know, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns didn't make it. So yeah. we did yeah. something right. Uh, you did. You definitely did. So tell me about where you came from, where you grew up. Where did, where did you grow up? I grew up uh, in two small towns near Lubbock. One was Leveland, and then uh, I finished high school, fourth grade through high school in Rawls, a small cotton farming community about 24 miles um, east of Lubbock. Okay, okay. Grew and up working on the farm, always working. Since fourth grade, carry a hoe, go work out in the, in the fields and chop weeds. Wow, wow. A lot of kids don't do that these days, it seems like, that they're not out there and working that's probably the biggest blessing i got mm. you know a work ethic work ethic yeah. thank you mom yeah yeah thank exactly. you mom. always worked always mowed yards hoed cotton work on the farms right Decided i didn't like that so started running swimming pools mm. <laughs> <laughs> decided i want to work in an office so i went to college mm. there you yeah. go yeah. and where did you go to college i uh, went to undergrad at texas tech and graduate school at smu here in dallas okay all right texas tech has had some big big uh wins and national championships playing for basketball and you were saying there's like five different yeah five in the last 90 days uh um the basketball team the girls softball team indoor track outdoor track and now recently the baseball team is playing in the super regionals on friday in lubbock got the chance to go to minneapolis for the final four which was I, I told my wife, my life is complete now. I've done everything. You know, <laughs> going to heaven. I've got a successful career and family. And Tech went to the national championship. Oh my I'm gosh! <laughs> wow. So you were there when they at the uh, at the college at the college championships. Yes, it, championships. it was great fun. Wow, man, that was that was unfortunate. I was on a plane coming back, and we landed. Yeah. I kept trying to look at my phone, and then I got in the last like two minutes uh, in the airport. Man, yeah, I'm was, afraid we gave it away. Uh, I would say that was probably the first game that I ever felt so bad for the kids. I didn't feel bad for me. I had a great experience. I felt so bad for the kids because I've never seen any team in my life play with more heart and fight than that basketball team did over the course of the year. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. fantastic. Yeah, they were. They're Bunch good. of zero, two-star, three-star kids going against, you know, superstars. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's great. That's great. Do they do they graduate a lot of seniors this year? Will they have a good team You know, they year? did. They've got uh, three kids back. Uh, two, one of them was a starter. Okay. So um, now, now the challenge for Coach Beard will be: How do I get four and five star kids to play as a team and play defense 
like I did these other kids. A little right. easier with kids, you know, that, that weren't recruited by every school in the country. Now he's got a bunch of kids coming in where everybody wanted them, and they might be a little bit more uh, prima donna. So it'll be a really interesting mm. coaching challenge because now he's got to face the same thing as Shaka Smart and UT, who had to change his game, or Coach Seski at Duke or anyone else. Right, right. And he's all about defense. He's all about defense. So if he can keep that going, it'll work for him. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Very good, very good. And so, how did you like tech, or what did you learn at tech? I, I want to get into your career. So, after tech and after SMU, what did you do then, and where did, how did you get into investments? Did you go straight into investments? Is that what you went to college for? Uh, you know, I knew pretty quick that I, I liked it. You know, I started out in electrical engineering. Uh, there were no girls in electrical engineering. There was one in my class, and so I switched to business school after I took a business school class. Pretty shallow, I know, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it is what it is. But at the same time, uh, I knew I always liked finance, and I always loved math, and I was good at math, and it was probably a blessing. I wasn't as good at physics as I was math. Mm. And uh, I got an accounting and finance degree, uh, which which turned out to be a good move because I've always had a bias towards kids with accounting and finance. Uh, and and that that was really a good move. I had someone give me some advice for that, and I try to give kids advice too. If you like finance, get a lot of accounting classes. Hmm. Okay. You All know, right. Good. You know, some a lot of finance majors are accounting rejects. You know, they couldn't make it in accounting, so they're in finance. So right. We don't want those kids. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. So uh, graduated. Your career? Yeah. yeah. Came came to to Dallas. So there were no uh, finance or investment banking jobs available in Rawls. Uh, 1,600 people, so I came to Dallas. <laughs> so, uh, and I started, and it was this was right after the crash of October of 87, so I'd had a couple of offers, and they were pulled, and luckily I had the accounting degree. So uh, I went to work for a company called CLR Fast Tax, which back then used mainframes to do tax returns, and uh, so I was happy to just get a job. I worked there for a year, uh, was very grateful, and then went to work for Murray Savings just in time for the SNL crisis. Mm, wow! And I worked in investments and accounting and uh, budgeting, risk management uh, for them for a year, and then luckily I was recruited to go to the place that I wanted to work for right out of college, which is a firm called Rauscher Pierce Refinis. They were a very large regional brokerage firm based in Dallas. And at that time, you didn't have private equity and hedge funds and whatnot. So if you really wanted a good finance job, you had to pretty much go to New York or Chicago. There weren't a lot of choices. Uh, Rauscher was really about the only choice. And so I felt very lucky to get on there. I stayed there for seven years. was fortunate. They paid for my graduate school at SMU, which I'm eternally grateful for. Um, I went and got a bunch of le letters by my name because I had low self-esteem. And... Uh, and then joined my partners, you know, and and uh, from Rauscher in 1996, I left Rauscher as head of the financial institutions group. Wow, that's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah, it was a great ride. Good firm. Yeah. So then you're pretty close to Commerce Street at that time. Wait, say that again. I think you're pretty close to joining uh, Commerce Street. Well, at that yeah, time. it was Samco Capital Markets at that time. Joined yeah. them in '96, and then we did a friendly lift out in '07 to create Commerce Street. Okay. All right. Great. 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 So. What is it that you learned from the financial crisis, you know, back with this SNL stuff and how did that affect your career emotionally, trying to find a job, or I guess you stayed in your job at that time? And what was it going through? I mean, this life is not easy, right? So it was hard to get jobs back then. You know, of course, we didn't have all this stuff on the internet. We used the one ads of a newspaper. Mm. And my parents lived in Greenville, Texas at the time. They had moved from Rawls. Uh, which is 40 miles northwest of here, northeast of here. And I would drive in every day, you know, cold Looking calling basically on the on the one ads. And that's how I got uh, the job at CLR Fast Tax. And it took a while. It took several months. But you got to approach looking for a job uh, as a job. And you do it dawn to dusk every day and just never quit until something happens. Right. And you got to expect, you know, hundreds of rejects. And mm. that's kind of what happened. Mm. And I was lucky to get one. Wow. Wow. Good for you. Good yeah, for you. I always felt lucky to get that first start. Yeah. Yeah. So in your career, would it be more about who you know or what you know, trying to get that job and advance in your career? I think who you know helps quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I teach a class uh, 
at Tech and, uh, and, and some other universities on what your resume ought to look like. And I teach it to freshmen mm. so that they know, you know, and, and it doesn't matter if it's business or this, that, and the other, but I, I use some sample resumes. So, because if you try to create your resume at the end of college, you know, it's too late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does my resume in college need to look like when I get out? Oh, that's great. Or when I start looking for a job, which should be my junior year, or to get those internships. The competition is so tough nowadays, Jay, and you know this, that people are weeded out uh, for their grade point average. Mm -hmm. You know, in our business, in our firm, you come in, if your your GPA is below a 3.5, there's a good chance you're going to get weeded out. Mm. Right, you know, right. Uh, if it's below a three point for sure. Right. You know, right. Uh, if you don't have 12 hours of accounting, if you haven't shown some activities in school. And then you're left with what? A bunch of kids that have high grade point averages that went to great schools, that took all the classes, and now they got to interview. You got to have internships as well. Mm, okay. You know, so we look for kids that have good active internships. And used to, it was most anything, just as long as you're working. We, get, we want to see that you have a, a work ethic. Uh, but now we like to see that it's in the industry because it just ramps up the learning curve uh, or at least flattens it so that, so that you can get more work done right. in a hurry. So a lot of these kids are coming in with one, two, or three years of internship experience in finance or at a bank or at an accounting firm. It makes a big difference. And if you come into college and you don't know what you want to major in or what your resume is going to look like at the end, put you at a distinct disadvantage. Mm, okay. And it's very difficult to put that kind of pressure on a 17, 18 year old kid to know exactly what you want to do when you grow up. Right. Because I got to tell you, if you ask me what I want to do right now, when I grow up, I'm still not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I'm doing it. Yeah, but you've done well, and you, you've uh, you've helped create that. So let's get back to that a little bit. So, in sure. if I if I if I'm at Tech, do I have to be at Tech to take this class? Is it a is it a class? Is it a? You it, it was a one day deal that the dean set up with okay. me, and I would come in and yeah, and they would they would send it out to all the freshmen. They'd send it out to everyone, but it's really a lot more advantageous for you if you're a freshman or sophomore right. than it is a junior or senior because right. then it's too late. Right. That's a and, great thought. Yeah, it's a great thought, and I think every school ought to do that. Absolutely, Just, it's it's sort of like what what I want the end result to look like. Yeah, at least start thinking about it. Right. You know, and I chair uh, the alumni corporation for uh, the fraternity I was involved with out at Tech as well, and and we do the same thing for them there. Okay. You know, hey, let's sit down and talk about what your resume looks like, who you're going to know. You know, using your network within the fraternity, using your network with. Uh, uh, tech grads using your network within the business school if that's where you went and how to integrate and look for a job right because right. it's it's tough out there yeah it is it is tough out there and obviously the 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 job that you take right out of college is chances are really good and we were talking about this with john malden earlier you know it may not be the the job that you're going to have for the rest of your life but it's also pretty important of where you go next or or the learning experience you have and i always tell entrepreneurs you know it's always good to to find that job that you really do want to go into later and work for five years, you know, like Roush or Pierce. That gave you a great work ethic. I know they wanted you to pound the phones, you know, and they wanted you to hit up and be rejected, you know, 400,000 times Absolutely. a month and things of that, of that nature. But that was really a good learning experience because my first five years, I didn't have that. And uh, even though I was a stockbroker from 85 to 90, I kept trying to do it on my own and then i joined another group in 1990 that that helped me with my work ethic and i wish i'd have done that five years prior well you know it's you funny know. you should say that because i grew up on the analyst side with the investment banking side and i'd always lamented the fact that i never had probably that stockbroker training and i think the most valuable thing you can get that is what you were talking about get from that is making those calls and getting over the fear of rejection, not taking it personal, turning it into a numbers game. That is such a valuable lesson for people. And, right. And um, I had to learn it in a different way much later in my career. Mm, right, right. It's all about the goals and putting a time value on it. And also, too, at Angelo State University, which we're, we're a brother. Kindred. Yeah, <laughs> if you will. I'd love to use that if you will and i'd like to go back and and angelo state once a year and do that same class so Absolutely. i need i need to know 
kind of a cheat sheet, if you will. Happy to do to it. To do that, yeah. So absolutely, that'd be so, great. So uh, that that I do I do appreciate. I'm a big that. fan of the president of Angelo State, uh, Mr. Brian. May. Yeah, Brian. Brian. Oh he's man, he's fantastic. Awesome. He is a great guy. Really good. He is a great guy. We need yes. to send him this interview to make yeah, sure if, he. If you know him, tell him I said something bad about him. I will. I definitely will. <laughs> no, that, give him my regards. He, I yeah. think very very highly of him. Yeah, I'm gonna be out there uh, Monday. Matter of fact, great. this Monday I'm gonna play in the golf tournament and I'll see him and I'll I will tell him. Great. I got a lot of family down that area. Do you really? It's a great great place. Great place. It's going to be about 120 degrees during their summer golf tournament every year, but a dry heat. A dry heat. That's dry right. Heat. Exactly. So if you spontaneously combust, just remember it's a dry flight. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. So let's talk about uh, so books or something. Books. You're a big reader. You like books. I'm a, big, I'm a voracious reader. What would you read if you were 20 years old? Well, you know, I can't tell anyone what to read, just that they need to read, okay? I guess there's a bunch of junk out there. My mother, uh, who's a Menza and and a more avid reader than me, and she's one of these that can just sort of Mm. turn pages, you know. She's frustrated with me because I I don't read a lot of fiction. I love reading biographies. I love reading history. And I'm like, there's so much to know. There's so much to learn. I love learning uh, that I'm like, well, sort of feel like I'm wasting my time with fiction once in a while. But I try to insert a fiction book every now and then because the prose and the writing style is so much different Mm -hmm. and it's a lot more pleasant and uh, probably better for your imagination to have something, you know, once in a while. So it's not that I don't like fiction. I just feel this immense pressure to learn more in other areas. So I love reading about history, American history, European history. I love to study theology, uh, you know, all, ki- all kinds of stuff. What would you What would you wish you would have read when you were twenty? Is there any particular book? I always think about thinking, grow rich. Oh, I think about setting goals. I'm a big Zig Ziglar. You know, I grew up in I the love Zig, Zig Ziglar, Ziglar days. Yes, and, you well, know, see you at the top. top. <laughs> see you at the top. And, Absolutely. Uh, but is there anything in particular that you wish that you would have read? Well, when if you I were wish I'd read it, I probably read it because I'll go out and buy it. Mm. And which uh, I probably have a fight once a week with my wife about all the books that I'm buying and storing around the house. <laughs> that is my vice. And so they're sitting around the house like a, a unharvested fruit, wait, waiting to be plucked from the vine and to be read. And gotcha. And uh, so. I don't know, but I've read a lot of books, and, okay. and I'm always looking for one of the things that I'll do. If you're a, a voracious reader, I'll email you after this and go give me 10 favorite books that you have, and I'll look okay. through them and pick a few. Gotcha. I love trading lists. Okay, good. That'd be great. Love to do that. Love to do yeah. that. What is it that you um, can see in your career? Is what, what are the goals for Commerce Street? What are some big goals things for that, that you guys are working on? So we can go to your website. We can sign up. Sure. Log in. I'm sure you have a newsletter. I know you got a once a year conference. We do have and, some newsletters. You know, yeah. our clients tend to be companies mm-hmm. uh, or high net worth individuals or family offices. Uh, you kind of have to look around a little bit. But we help people. We love helping people. We really do. And maybe that's a weakness on Wall Street because we want people to like us. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure everyone on Wall Street feels that way. Uh, but we we get more pleasure out of helping people and uh so for example i went to see a a client in houston the other day and i took a banker with me out out of a bank that's a client and literally you know by the end of the meeting we're going to improve his 401k reduce the risk uh bring that over uh we're going to remove his senior note over to this bank um we're going to um he's going to move his deposits uh, he needs to buy out a partner, so we're going to raise some money, probably wow. through a mezzanine investment, put it in there, buy out his partner, so he can continue to stay independent. Uh, his majority owner is looking for new investments in some of these alternative asset products that we have, a bank fund and private equity fund, a industrial warehouse fund, all these different things that we have. Uh, you know, it was pretty exciting. That, uh, that was a big I, meeting. Yeah, I can't say that every meeting is that for <laughs> successful. <laughs> But it's really fun to go in and have a lot of great products, and there's almost no one that we can visit with that we can't do at least something for. Well, wow. you know, okay, and it and it may not be investing in anything. Maybe it's just giving free advice. Right, we do that too. Right, well, that's you know, great because we know it'll come back to us in other ways. Right, exactly. That's great. Good, good for you. Good for you. Hey, so Dory, now let's talk about retirement. So what what is what is what do you see in retirement for? These millennials, or do you see it for um, the people that are older? What What is your idea of, of retirement? Well, let's break that down in two areas. There's 401k plans, right? Defined contribution plans, and there's defined benefit plans. 
So briefly on defined benefit plans, pension funds, we've got a big crisis out there. A lot of them are underfunded. You know, we're, for example, we're in the best city and the best state and the best country in the world, and our Dallas Police and Fire Pension Fund is broke. Mm. And it needs to be fixed, and the ball keeps getting kicked down the road. Uh, we have fewer uh, policemen. They're not paid enough. It puts a risk to the whole city. It's a real shame. And they really, it really starts with good governance. We have bad governance with that fund. And there needs to be a big movement in the country to fix things from the top with good governance. That also happens over on the 401k side. We briefly talked earlier about some of the issues there. But there are good 401ks and there are bad 401ks. And since they're defined contribution plans, it starts with the retiree. They need to maximize their contributions. It's a free benefit. Most employers do a match. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking at changing laws to extend and and reduce the tax rate on these things as you get them out. It is such a wonderful way to save. The average person has a chance at wealth, maybe through their house or through their 401k. Mm -hmm. They need to take advantage of it, especially the 401k, because the house involves a lot of debt. Mm. 401k does not. So first thing we try to teach people is save the max at all times. And it's so hard to get young people to understand that because they think they're not making enough money and they're going to make more money later. And as you and I know, yeah, but so do the expenses. You know, we get family, we get kids, we got college, we've Mm. got, you know, in-laws or whatever we're taking care of. Uh, It doesn't get easier when you're older to Mm. save them out. So you have to start saving when you're young and you need to shoot for a minimum of 10%, try to do 20. Wow. You cannot save enough. Wow. You cannot save what, enough. What do you think it takes to retire on these days? Well, it depends on what your living is, right? Okay. You know, it, it's you really can you can Sulfur retire on very or little. Rawls, yeah, you, you, you want to move than... to Rawls and live in a tent. You know, it's not going to take a whole lot. You want to stay in Dallas and live in, uh, you know, Park Cities or Preston Hollow or something, it's going to take a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And you better budget accordingly. And if that's what you want to do with you retire, you need to be thinking about that when you're in your 30s or 40s because maybe you want to save a little bit more if you want to have a nice plus retirement and be able to travel the globe. You know, right, it takes right. a lot of money. So let's look at um, a dollar amount here of $5 million. Okay. Uh, if if you earn 5% of that, that's 250000 a year. That's pretty good, pretty good chunk of money. You right. can live off of that in retirement. You know, used to, you could get those kind of returns on municipal tax free bonds, which is a great way to retire. Mm. You know, a $5 million tax-free portfolio, very little to no risk. Right. And you're getting tax-free income. But the rates are so low nowadays, mm. kind of hard to do. But I would tell you, if rates do go up in the future, building a nice tax-free bond portfolio where you don't have to worry right. is, is a pretty great way to, to Just retire. Just get a monthly check. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. But absent that, you got to have exposure to stocks and bonds and private investments. Okay. That's Commerce Street. That's what, that's that's what, what you do. got. We Y'all do sit that. down with the high net worth individuals once a quarter? Yeah, as often as they keep, need to. Yeah. And, and we create very passive, low cost portfolios for as small as 20 basis points. Okay. Uh, you know, most people are charging a point or more. Mm-hmm. And the underlying fees in those investments are lower as well. And okay. that's really the secret to higher returns. Get okay. rid of all the fees, the transaction costs, the expenses. And if you can do that, you'll make a lot of money. Hmm. And if people have confidence in what you're doing, you know, uh, then they won't chase returns, which is the biggest enemy that I see in investing. Okay. Where people are chasing returns. Oh, this large cap manager did really well last quarter or uh, this sector fund did really good and so I'm going to put some money in it. Most investors don't realize they, how much money they can lose. Studies from Dalbar have shown over the last 20 years that you can lose anywhere from 280 to 460 basis points a year wow. from fund chasing and what we call fund hopping. Right, That right. is a big enemy to most investors. Right. Okay. What do you think about the stock market? I mean, it's is it overvalued now? Is it a good time to... It's probably fairly valued. Uh, in some areas, it's undervalued. For example, we're very uh, heavy bank investors. Most banks or many banks are trading at single-digit PEs right now, while the rest of the market is, say, at 15 or 16. Mm. Uh, it's priced in a recession. It's priced in fear. In fact, banks have been a fear trade ever since the downturn in 08. Mm-hmm. So if we have fears of a China trade war, 
then a community bank based in Dallas or somewhere in Texas will trade down. That right. has no exposure to China. That's a buy signal for me. Right. We like right. to buy on false, what we call false fears. Okay. All right. What do you think about the oil markets? Oil market? Ooh, you know, the technology and everything we really like. So the thing that really governs what's going on in the oil market is world demand. And you really got to follow that. And it looks like it might be softening a little bit, mm -hmm. but we kind of expect oil to stay in a range of 45 to maybe 65 over the next few years. Yeah. Uh, and if it will, that'll be great for for the U.S., for Texas. You know, what's going on in the Permian is mind boggling. You're talking about people that come to stop signs and maybe wait an hour to get through. Mm. And well, if you haven't been out to the Permian to see the traffic, to see the infrastructure issues, it is, it is basically like discovering a Saudi Arabia out there or oil field. Yeah. You know, the, the potential out there is amazing. Yeah. And for us to be able to do with that oil field and get that oil out, if we can keep prices up to a decent amount, uh, you know, we're energy independent as a nation. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a great thing for the economy, a great thing for Texas, a great thing for our defense policy and the whole world. I mean, it is a really big deal. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I mean, with seeing the Permian go from a million barrels a day to four million barrels a day in a really short time. Yeah, and they're talking it, now phenomenal. maybe ten million. You yeah. know, it's a capac It's not an oil issue; it's an infrastructure issue. Right, right. I know we got hit last quarter of um, two thousand um, eighteen because we just uh, there was so much oil and the pipelines weren't built yet, and so the refineries were totally full. And they said, okay, well. We don't want your oil, but if you want to sell it to us, we're going to take 15 bucks a barrel off. Yeah, know? I heard about uh, some yeah. of those stories about uh, <laughs> how they were getting oil through the pipelines and the, and the inefficiencies and pricing that were going on. It was right. pretty amazing. Right, right. It was – It was. what about real estate? Is, is there any big real estate – I mean, maybe if you look at Dallas in, in itself and, and the growth, 100,000 people a year. I mean, we've got a, like a Waco coming into Dallas – every year right now and uh just been growing and you know it's amazing for those that have been in dallas uh you know 30 years or more like ourselves um you know we had a ghost town for downtown you know for 20 years mm -hmm. because of what happened in the 80s so to see all the activity that's going on down there all the cranes that are building things uh it's pretty amazing it's very exciting uh the anecdote i like to say is last week i told my wife you know, I don't want to go to Preston Center tonight. I want to go downtown. Mm. You know, that was unheard of 10 years, oh, 15 yeah. years, 20 years ago. Right, and right. Now, and now it's fun. There's a lot going on. A lot going on. And so it's, I'm really proud of Dallas, very excited because, you know, it's such a great city to have such a, a week downtown for many years. And now it's very exciting with people living down there in retail. I think you got to be spotty on your investing in, in real estate. Uh, there's some crowded areas. There's still some inefficiencies. And you just, you just have to be picky one of the areas that we like is uh industrial warehouses hmm. uh you know guess what walmart and amazon need another warehouse <laughs> 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 and and uh, some people are calling that extended retail because all the risk that's happening in the retail space right. and shopping centers and the efficiencies that people get out of warehouses now so i think if you're real careful with warehouses and and play in some niche areas you can do some tremendous returns, and we've had very good success with that. That's great. So you have a fund or something that people could invest if they came to your website and yeah. met with Well, your... they have to come see us and, and then or call us, and we can tell them about. I can't market it over the over the air, obviously, but but we we have some we have some ideas for them that we can talk to. There them. you go. I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. But you got to call. You got to call and talk to Lori or, yeah. or your your staff because you sure. got a big you have a big group there. Okay, good. Well. You know, it's Father's Day coming up, and uh, I know you're a father, and we appreciate all the fathers in the in the world and all the things that we do on our side. Mothers had their day a, a month ago, and um, we do appreciate that, obviously. And uh, that, that'll be this weekend. Uh, well, you know, a good Father's Day is is when your honeydew list is half the size it normally. Is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a good. That's a, that's a good metric. That's a good. It's a good metric. I had Quantified. a good day. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's play this or that. This is uh, one of Kim's favorite favorite um, favorite games. But we talk about you know about you more about you getting to know you. So do you like the beach or or the mountains? I like them both. I like I'd them both. Pick the mountains. Pick the mountains. I, uh, not as hot. 
Yeah. Uh, but I, I love going to Laguna Beach. I love going to Hawaii. Uh, the trip's a little long. But if, if I get to pick, I'm going to pick the mountains probably eight or ten. Eight, eight out of ten times. Yeah. Summer or winter? Now that I'm older, I'd say summer. Summer, yeah. Yeah, yeah summer in the mountains. Yeah. Not summer in August. <laughs> I tell people I'm a seventh generation Texan, and every August I wonder why. <laughs> It's hot here. <laughs> it is hot here. Yeah, it was hot yesterday. I played in the golf tournament for our engineers, and it was it was definitely toasty. And it's not going to get any better. But hopefully, we'll get our bodies will get used to it a little bit better as, as we go on. So uh, that's good. So do you do you use the telephone more? Call people or do you text? All of the above. All of the above. I, I had this discussion with some sales group today. You know, you, you you try to I try to send emails. You know, five in the morning, six in the morning because you know i don't need to be in the office i can do them in an early time and if i do that a couple times and i don't answer it's time to switch modes try a text try a phone call try linkedin if you need to right. send a, a telegram you know but if you're trying to get a hold of people you have to be persistent but you don't want to pester them so a, a lot of ways to, to deal with that is just you know switch the mode of communication i got you okay so pancakes or waffles hmm. Uh, chicken and waffles. Chicken and waffles, all right. <laughs> then you have a favorite place. Yes, the best. I've tried chicken and waffles all over the country, all over the south, the low country. The best chicken and waffles, I think, are at Breadwinners. Free advertisement. Maybe they'll pay me, but they do a great job. They do jalapeno cheddar bacon waffles wow. with their chicken, and they put a little gravy and some Tabasco on top, and it's fantastic. Wow. That's great. There you go. Breadwinners for chicken and waffles. So that, I need to try that. I love chicken and waffles. Absolutely. It's really Don't good. do it on a weekday, though. You'll pass out at work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, hey, thank you very much, Dory, for coming in today. We do appreciate you and Commerce Street. Go to Commerce Street, get their website, and learn more about Dory. He's all over the place. You're up in New York. You're everywhere learning more about what, um, what people know about you, and uh, you're a good Good sounding board. We appreciate you having uh, having you on, and I hope to have you on again soon. That'd be great, and it was an honor to be here. So thanks for having me, Jay. Thank really you very much. It. Thank you very much. Thank you, you bet. All right.